Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video, we're going to look at the QR decomposition that allows us to write a matrix in terms of the product of an orthogonal matrix and an upper triangular one. The QR decomposition has a number of uses. In particular, it's very useful for solving linear least squares problems, and we'll discuss why in this video. We call an n by n matrix Q orthogonal if its rows and columns form orthonormal vectors. And specifically, let's look at two columns of this matrix that we'll call QI and QJ. Then the dot product of QI and QJ should be equal to zero if I is not equal to J, and one if I is equal to J. And in matrix form, that tells us that Q transpose times Q is equal to the identity. Similarly, by looking at the rows of our matrix Q, we can deduce that Q times Q transpose is also equal to the identity. So a nice feature of orthogonal matrices is that they actually preserve the Euclidean norm when applied to vectors. So let's look at a vector V, and let's look at the Euclidean norm squared of Q times V. So we can write that out as V transpose Q transpose QV, and since the Q transpose Q will vanish, and become the identity, we'll just get V transpose V. And therefore, this will just give us the Euclidean norm squared of V. Since orthogonal matrices preserve the Euclidean norm, we can think of them as performing transformations that are reflections or rotations. And this property that vectors do not change in magnitude is very nice from a scientific computing perspective because it tells us that we don't expect any amplification of error when we use orthogonal matrices. We'll now look at the QR factorization. And suppose that we now have a matrix A that's m by n, where m is greater than or equal to n. So this matrix has more rows than columns. Then we can write A is equal to Q times R where Q is an m by m orthogonal matrix, and R is a m by n rectangular matrix, and the first n by n square block of R is an upper triangular matrix that we call R hat, and the remaining rows of R are all zero. Now, we can use the QR factorization as a way to solve linear systems. Suppose that we have a linear system AX equal B, then we could write that QR of X is equal to B, and we could apply Q transpose to both sides, and that would tell us that R of X is equal to Q transpose B, and we now have an upper triangular matrix system to solve, and we can solve that using back substitution as we saw for the LU factorization. So while this is a workable approach, you actually find that to create the QR factorization, it requires more floating point operations than for the LU factorization. And therefore, for solving linear systems, the LU factorization is usually the more popular choice. However, the QR factorization has other benefits, and in particular, as we'll see, it's very good for solving overdetermined linear least squares problems of the form A x equal B, where now A is a rectangular matrix um, with more rows than columns. To see why, let's look at the two norm squared of the linear least squares residual. So this can be written as the two norm squared of B minus A x. And using our QR factorization, we can write that as the two norm squared of B minus Q applied to our matrix R hat and zero applied to x, and since q is orthogonal, we know that we can pre-multiply the term in this norm by q transpose, since this will not affect the size of the norm. So we'll therefore end up with the two norm squared of q transpose b minus our matrix with r hat and zero applied to x. Now, Let's write Q transpose B in terms of two parts, C1 and C2. And C1 
contains the first n components and C2 contains the remaining n minus n components. So that allows us to write our two norm squared of the residual in terms of two components. The first part is the two norm squared of C1 minus r hat applied to x and the second is the two norm squared of C2. And so we've now broken up this Euclidean norm squared into the Euclidean norm squared of two smaller vectors. So now we can ask a question. How can we minimize the residual based on this form of the expression? To answer this, let's note that the only thing that we can control is x. And if we look at this expression, we see that the second term has no dependence on x and therefore we can't affect its size. However, if we look at the first term, we see that we have a linear system that we can solve. And we can minimize this, the size of this term by setting the r hat of x is equal to c. So if we now solve this n by n triangular system, r hat of x is equal to c, then that will give us the solution to this linear least squares problem. And in unit one, we looked at the LSTSQ function in Python, and we discussed how this was a good way to solve linear least squares problems. And indeed, the way that this algorithm is actually working is via doing this QR factorization. In addition, another nice feature we get from this derivation is we see that the minimum Euclidean norm of the residual will actually be equal to the Euclidean norm of this vector C2. Recall that when we solve linear least squares problems using the normal equations, we had to deal with this matrix A transpose A and solve linear systems that involved A transpose A. We therefore were dependent on the condition number of A transpose A, and this can be shown to be equal to the condition number of A squared. We'll actually see this a little later on in this unit when we come to look at the singular value decomposition, the SVD. Using this QR approach, we avoid having to deal with this square of the condition number. And that makes this approach using the QR factorization much more numerically stable. So how do we compute the QR factorization? Well, there are a number of methods we can use to do this. And in this course, we're going to look at three different approaches. We're going to look at Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. We're going to look at householder triangularization. And then we're also going to look at Givens rotations. And each of these methods has their own strengths and weaknesses. And in the next three videos in this course, we'll discuss these three methods in turn.